Well, I know that there were a number of you gone last Sunday. Uh, there was a, a conflict uh, downtown with the memorial run, which has become quite popular. I know many of our guests obviously were not here last Sunday. But I felt I needed to start off this morning uh, because our speaker last Sunday made a slip up that I felt should not go unaddressed. Uh, for those of you that don't know, the speaker last week is the same as the speaker this week. So uh, relax, I'm not calling anybody out, okay? So to help him with what was an obvious uh, fox pos, or some people say faux pas, I have written a, a short poem uh, to try to extricate himself from this situation. There once was a pastor who tried to be hip. Into the world of hip hop and rap, he did dip. Unfortunately for him, some millennial did say, if you don't have a pronunciation guide, you'd best stay away. <laughs> so back to the Bible, this dear man did go. He promises to stay closer to the stuff he doth know. So next time he ventures too far down that road, someone please jump up and say, Kanye, don't go. <laughs> so, uh, there's been some controversy as to the pronunciation of that man's name. Uh, in my research, I understand he accepts either pronunciation, uh, the one that I rendered or the one that many of you uh, reminded me of. So, but hey, he's not my man anyway. Uh, I'm a Lecrae guy. Maybe, uh, what? Maybe a little Tadashi, maybe a little Bizzle, maybe a little Triple E, maybe a little, uh, maybe a little KB, KJ52. I mean, those are my guys. So, uh, those are the guys I get down with. And uh, so, I just want you to know that I can be relevant on some level. Hey, we're studying on Sunday morning from the book of Colossians. It's a 95-verse little masterpiece that uh, Paul has written to the believers in Colossae. So if you'd open your Bible, uh, open your iPad, open your iPhone, uh, open your pew Bible to 983. We have a new pew Bible in front of you there. Here's what we've learned to this point. We have learned that Colossae is a rather unimportant, nondescript place. And uh, of all of the places that Paul wrote to, probably the least prominent. And I actually take some encouragement from that. The fact that, uh, you know, the world sees things very differently than God does most of the time. And uh, so what the world looks at as being important may or may not be important to God. Uh, what the world looks at as being unimportant may in fact be very important to God. And I think that would certainly be the case here. The church of uh, Colossae is different too because it was a church that was not started by the Apostle Paul. Uh, as far as we know, he may have been to Colossae at some point, but he had not evidently met these believers. He did not start this church. Uh, he doesn't have a, a personal relationship with them as he did so many of the other letters that he wrote, but he still cared very deeply about them. And that's obviously what comes through uh, in this letter. And that care is really centered around the concern that he has for them. And that concern is driven primarily by the fact that false teaching and false teachers had made their way into Colossae as they had almost everywhere else the gospel had gone. And so because this false message was spreading, Paul begins in verse 3 and goes all the way to verse 14 in this long, wonderful, remarkable prayer. And he begins in verse 3 with a note of thanksgiving. He ends at the end of this prayer on a note of thanksgiving. And I've got to tell you that I have been convicted about how thankless I often am in my life. When I think of all of the ways that God has blessed me and all of the things that he has done, and whether it is a particularly good season or whether it's a difficult season, uh, what you get out of the heart of the Apostle Paul is that this man has been so transformed and changed by the gospel uh, that he is a, a man who is readily giving thanks. Uh, in times when he is enduring and pushing through, in times uh, when God is, is obviously blessing his life in other ways, and uh, so I was personally just convicted again this week that 
Lord, help me to reflect more of what a spirit-filled believer looks like because I can assure you that a spirit-filled believer is a grateful, thankful person. And uh, I just felt that Paul was a, a strong encouragement to me. Here's what we want to see this morning. Why is he so thankful? Because of what God has done for us in Christ is so amazing that it simply cannot be captured, it can't be described, it can't be fully understood in a single word or phrase. He's going to do that in multiple ways which we want to look at. And it really underscores this, the amazing work of God on our behalf and it reminds us again that everything that he has done for us, he has done on the basis of grace. So let me read for us in Colossians chapter 1. I want to just start off by reading at verse 9 and we'll read to verse 14. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Let's pray. Father, before us is a remarkable statement of what you have done for us. And, and we just come right now, Father, and we come in a, in a spirit of dependency and in a spirit of humility Father, we desire that your spirit will speak powerfully into our lives. That we want to be changed and transformed by your truth. We want your spirit to, to uplift us and encourage us, to convict us, to point us to the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. So, Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for this place. Thank you for these people. Thank you for this word that you have given to us. And we uh, look to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. What I want us to see in these verses this morning is nothing less than the magnanimous work of our Heavenly Father. That's what this section is about. It's about the magnanimous work of our Heavenly Father. Before we look at these verses that we've just read, I want to make two observations that I think are pertinent to what we're going to be looking at. The first one is that within the divine plan of salvation, the Father is the one who takes the initiative toward us. When we read the scriptures and we see the unfolding of the plan of redemption, the plan of salvation, we are repeatedly reminded that it is the Father who moves towards us. That's what Paul underscores in verse 3. That's what he underscores in verse 12. He's saying, Father, thank you for what you've done. Father, thank you for moving into our life. Thank you for the gospel that has come to us and set us free. I think sometimes in our Trinitarian theology, we think that somehow the Father has to be convinced to love us, that it's Jesus who's kind of the one that's pulling this all together, and he's convincing the Father to love us and to move towards us, and that simply is a misunderstanding, for sure, of, of Scripture. Now, it is true that the Father's wrath and judgment has to be dealt with, doesn't it? We'll see more of that in just a moment, but it is the Father who moves towards us in his great love and he's the pursuer he's the initiator and and what you see secondly in in light of that is that these verses really are the testimony of paul these verses are nothing less than the testimony of the apostle paul in fact if you want to see that you go to acts 26 and in acts 26 and uh, in in verse uh, 17 you see something of a reflection of these verses uh, in, in Acts 26, let me just begin reading at 17. Delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. There's a strong correlation. As Paul is standing in this story in Acts 26, he's standing before King Agrippa and he's telling King Agrippa what's happened to him. And when he was walking on the Damascus Road, how God broke into his life, how the Father pursued him and initiated into his life the understanding of the gospel. And then you just lay Acts 26, 17, and 18 over Colossians, and we're going to see that in many ways, this is nothing less than the testimony 
of the Apostle Paul. So let's look this morning at five amazing words. Five amazing words that describe the Father's love, his grace, his work on our behalf. And the first of those words is the word qualified. The word qualified. So we're back in Colossians chapter 1. And again, let's jump in at verse 12. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in life. I want to begin each of these words with just a, a bit of a definition or a, a clarification of the word itself, and then we'll look at what he says about these words. So in this case, we're beginning with the idea that the Father has qualified us. Now, we all know what it means to be qualified. If you just think of stepping into the job market or into something that you want to do, that, that there are things that you have to have as a part of your resume, if you will, right? So we know what it means to be qualified. It means to be prepared, doesn't it? It means to be ready. It means to be sufficient for what the task is. You're able to do whatever that responsibility requires of you. And here's the interesting thing. The first three of these words that we're going to look at are all in what is called the aorist tense. The aorist tense looks into the past, usually, but it's more importantly looking at something that took place at a point in time. And so when Paul says that the Father has qualified us, he's looking back at a very specific point in time. And that very specific point in time, we're going to understand and we realize, has to do with when we put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ. And at the moment we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, at that point in time, Paul says, we were in fact qualified. We were given everything that was needed. We were made to be sufficient. We were made to be ready. We were taken from being disqualified to now, in fact, being qualified. So it is God the Father, Paul says, who has qualified you, and you can be absolutely certain of that because of what? Because of what he says next. Because you share in the inheritance. You have been qualified to share in the inheritance. Peter says something about the inheritance, doesn't he? If you go back to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Listen, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. That's what you have been qualified. By means of being qualified by the Father, you now have an inheritance. To receive an inheritance, you have to be qualified in some way, don't you? Usually you have to be a part of a family, or you have to be somebody's friend to receive an inheritance. Well, here it is the Father who has qualified us to receive this inheritance. And when you look at what Peter says, it reminds us that this, this inheritance has no ending. This inheritance has no imperfections. This inheritance can never be altered. This inheritance is forever. It is kept in heaven for you. It's a wonderful thing that he says. The other part of this description, of this inheritance, we are inheritors of the saints in light. So there is an inheritance that we are qualified for, and we are saints in light. Now the contrast between this verse and this whole picture of light that we're going to look at, and the verses that are going to come are stark. And it was pretty cool this morning because not only did Steve pick songs that spoke of light as opposed to darkness, even in a couple of the choir songs there was a reference as to the very same thing. And that's the, 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 the picture that he gives to us here. He's already said back in verse 3 that we're saints. We're set apart people. We're set apart to God. So we are set apart in this particular context. We're set apart to be in the light. Now the light, the idea of light in the Bible is such an incredibly powerful metaphor. We see light all through the scripture as being a metaphor for a number of things, not the least of which is the idea of truth. We are saints in light because we have come to understand and now we walk in truth. Light is a metaphor for purity. We walk in purity. We're saints in light because we know the truth. We walk in the truth. We're people of purity. Jesus says in John chapter 12, all right, John 12, at the end of John 12, it's the end of Jesus' public ministry because we know what comes in John 13, right? 
John 13 takes us to where we just finished up a few weeks back, the upper room discourse. So when you read in John 12, at the end of the chapter, he's almost at the end of his public ministry. And this is what Jesus says in John chapter 12 and in verse 35. So Jesus said to them, the light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. Jesus said that he was the light of the world, didn't he? Paul makes an amazing statement in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 16. And he says of the Father that he, that he exists, that he lives in unapproachable light. Unapproachable light. We know that because we know every time the glory of God is manifest, it is as if people are dead in the face of the unapproachable light of the glory and of the majesty and of the holiness of God. And so here we are, my friends, and we're brought into this inheritance as saints who are in light. I said last week that as a believer, we absolutely need a couple of things to walk with God in the will of God, in the way that he wants to. We have to be in the word. We have to be in the word. We have to be in the word for ourselves. And we have to be in a setting of accountability. We have to be in the word and we have to be in a setting of accountability. That's the importance of the gathering. That's the importance of a small group. And you know why that is? I'll tell you why that is. It is because sin is antisocial. It is because sin loves to stay in the shadows. It's because sin loves to stay in the darkness. And we're not of that anymore. Now we are saints in light. Light speaks of transparency. Light speaks of openness. Light speaks of people having permission to step into my life and see how I'm doing. And that's what he is saying to us here. Sin loves isolation. But light exposes and we need light. So, first off, we have been qualified by the Father. Secondly, we've been delivered. He says he has delivered us. It's the very same thing, okay? The word again for delivered is an aorist verb. That is, again, it's looking at a point in time. It's looking at something very specific. And again, it's looking back at the place where we put our trust in Christ. And at that moment, we were delivered. The word Delivered is the word for rescue. We've been rescued. So you think of special forces operators, right? And they go into incredibly difficult, dangerous situations, and they deliver somebody, don't they? They rescue somebody. They bring somebody out of a situation that they can't possibly get out of themselves. And that's the picture that he uses here. We have been delivered. From what? First of all, he says we've been delivered from the domain from the domain of darkness. We've been delivered from the domain. The word domain is that sphere into which we're born. And the sphere into which we're born, by nationality we may be Americans, or whatever your country of origin is. That's the country of origin that you are born into, right? That's the sphere in which you live. But here he reminds us that we're all born into another domain, And that other domain that we're all born into is the domain of sin. So that everybody that is born into this world is born into this world in a place of separation from God. The word domain is the word exousia. It's a very common word in the New Testament. It's it's the word for power. So look at this. He's saying that we're born into this sphere of authority. We're born into this sphere of power. We're born into this sphere of ruling power is how it is actually used in another place. So when you go to 1 John chapter 5 and verse 19, listen to what John says. We know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power, exousia, in the domain of, in the sphere of, who? The evil one. The evil one. So God has delivered us from this domain. Here's the simple truth. You're either in the domain 
of darkness or you're in the domain of light. There's only two domains. There's a domain of darkness and a domain of light. People want to add a third choice or a fourth choice or another choice. There are no other choices. There is the domain of darkness. There is the domain of light. And so here he says we're born into that domain and Satan is the one who rules in that domain. Satan is the one who is the evil one, the one who dominates in that world. He calls it furthermore the domain of darkness. It is the domain of darkness. It's the exact same thing that Jesus says back in Luke chapter 22. And in Luke chapter 22 and verse 53, listen to what Jesus says. When I was with you, this is at the moment of his arrest, okay? He's just about ready to be arrested. When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness, the domain of darkness, the exousia of darkness. It's the very same thing, the very same imagery that Paul uses here in Colossians chapter 1. It's a very vivid picture. Listen, if you think that all you need is to try a little harder, then you probably don't really think a lot about this matter of being rescued. You probably don't really think that if, if, if all you need to do for God is to do your best, and that's going to be good enough because at the end of the day, he's going to say, hey, you tried, thanks. Some people didn't even try. Then you really don't need to be delivered. You don't really need to be rescued. But if you understand what Paul's saying here, that there is no way for you to extricate yourself from the domain of darkness, then you fully understand that what's necessary and what God needs to do for us is he needs to step into our life and he does, in fact, need to rescue us. Listen to what the Bible says in Ephesians 4, 18. Darkened in their understanding, alienated from God. It's talking about those who live in the domain of darkness. That was us. 2 Corinthians 4. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, of the glory of Christ. Romans 13, 12, the night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. You see, that's what we needed to be delivered out of, a domain of darkness. And that is what God the Father has done for us. It's a compelling reason to share the gospel, my friend. We're still here, aren't we? We still live in the domain of darkness. Even though we've been delivered from it, we've been rescued from it, we're no longer of that power, but we still live here. And that's the compelling reason that we live on mission for the gospel. And it also, I think, is a compelling reason for us not to live in a constant state of defeat. We don't live in a world of defeat. We live in a world of victory. We've been qualified. We've been delivered. If every night you watch the news and every day you read the newspaper and you think, woe is me, this is horrible, this is a terrible time to be alive in America, you're on the wrong track. You're not reading the same Bible because he says he has qualified us and he has delivered us out of this darkness for one specific reason, to bring the light to those people who are still in darkness. So we don't need to live every day, woe is me. This is the worst that's ever been in the history of our country and maybe in fact our world. Well listen, that's why God has you here for right now. He's extricated you from that, but he's kept you here to bear witness to people who are still being held captive, who need to be themselves rescued. And so that brings us then to the third word. And the third word, how is this rescue going to happen? How's it going to take place? He tells us that we're going to be transferred. <laughs> we're going to be transferred, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. So we've been transferred. Guess what this word is? What do you suppose this word is? That's right, it's an aorist. It's once again looking back at a point in time, just as we have been qualified, just as we have been delivered, now he says we have, in fact, been transferred. This word, if we were living 
in about 60 A.D., when this letter was received at Colossae, and somebody stood and read this letter, and we would have heard this word, all right, this word transferred, I can assure you that word would have had a far more emotive meaning response to those people in the first century than it does to us. I mean, we might very well just read right by that word and not really think a whole lot about it. We've been transferred. Okay, great. I've been transferred before. This word would be similar in our day to being deported. That's the idea of this word. It's the idea of deportation. It's the idea of being rooted up out of where you live and being taken to another place. It happened regularly, obviously, in the ancient world. When a conquering nation, empire, would come and take over a people, they would transfer people from that place to their own, to be slaves. And that's the word that he uses here. So in your Old Testament history, you know when the northern ten tribes were taken into captivity by Assyria, this is the word. They were transferred. They were extricated from Israel. They were uprooted from their family, and they were taken to another place. In 586, when the two southern tribes were taken by Babylon, back to Babylon, and Daniel was transferred. Sounds pretty pleasant, but it's not. He was torn away from his family, and he was taken to a different place. That's what he's saying here. We have been transferred to a different kingdom, just as they would have been transferred to a different kingdom. We're under a new authority. We're under a new power. We have a different king. We have a different ruler. We have a new address. And as you read the New Testament, it becomes clear that we've been transferred from a place of darkness into a place of light. We've been transferred out of a place of slavery into a place of freedom. From condemnation, we now have forgiveness from the power of Satan. We are now under the power of God. And that's what he says next. Who is this new king that we serve under? Whose authority is over this new kingdom to which we've been transferred? What does he call him? He calls him the beloved son. We have been transferred into the kingdom of the beloved son. You could literally translate that, the son of his love. The son of his love. There's actually a Hebraic expression from the Hebrew that would use this as God's dear son. God's dear son. The son, now listen, the son who is the object of the wrath of God, right? The son who is the object of the wrath of God. The son who is going to die on that cross. The son who is going to make propitiation, covering for the sins of the world, is now referred to as the beloved son, as God's dear son. How is it that he, at one moment in time, is the son on whom the wrath of God is poured, and he's separated from the father by sin, as he becomes the sin bearer of the world, and now... The Holy Spirit can say of him, he is God's dear son. How is that possible? There's only one way that's possible. The God the Father and God the Son in eternity past, as that great plan of redemption unfolded, they were in wholehearted agreement together that this is the way they would reach out and bring salvation to us. In the mystery of the divine counsel, the Father and the Son agreed that it would be the Son who would willingly come to this earth, die on the cross, bear the wrath and judgment of a holy God. And yet at the end of it all, he would still be known as my dear Son, my beloved Son. My friends, on the basis of that, we have been qualified. On the basis of that, we have been delivered. On the basis of that, we've been transferred into this new kingdom. Now, we're not done because he says we've been redeemed. We've been redeemed. We have redemption. Now, we have to shift gears because now for the first time, we have a verb that's not an aorist verb, okay? We have one that's a present tense. And so here we understand that we possess, we continuously possess this redemption. Now you have been in church or you're familiar with the Bible at all, you've come across the word redemption from the Old Testament to the New. 
All through the Bible, we, we read about redemption. We read about a redeemer. We read about the redeemed ones. So it's a very common word in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, one of the very first places that we encounter this is in the picture of God taking his people out of Egypt, right? So that in Exodus chapter 6 and verse 6, the first place we see this, Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. And from that picture, all the way through the rest of the Old Testament and all the way through the New Testament, we have imagery of a redeemer and those that he has redeemed. And so then when you come to the New Testament, you not only have one word for redemption, you have six different words that describe redemption. And so the one that we have here in Colossians 1.14 is lutro. And in lutro, the word for redemption that is translated in our English redemption focuses on the idea of the ransom that is paid. The ransom that is paid. A payment has been made. Lutro often was used to talk about paying money to buy a slave, to take a slave out of the slave market, to purchase a slave. So there was a ransom, if you will, a price that was paid. Well, in this case, you start off that 14th verse with the pronoun in whom, in whom we have redemption. So who, is, who are we looking to? Who is in view here? Who do we have this redemption in? Well, it takes us right back to verse 13, doesn't it? At the end of verse 13, it is the beloved son. In whom we have redemption, that price, that ransom, that word lutro referring to the ransom paid, that ransom was paid by none other than the beloved son. It was paid by the Lord Jesus Christ who purchased us, he redeemed us by substituting his life for mine. I should have died. He died in my place. So Jesus is the agent, okay, of that redemption. But look at what we are redeemed from, what we are redeemed for, and what we are redeemed by. Look at those three things. First of all, we're redeemed from what? What is it that we're redeemed from? We're redeemed from... It can be interactive. We're, we're redeemed from slavery, right? We're redeemed from sin. We're redeemed from bondage. That's what we're redeemed from. We're purchased out of the slave market of sin. We're purchased out of that place of bondage. We're purchased out of that place of darkness, and we're brought into the light. What are we redeemed for? Well, here's where it gets interesting. What are we redeemed for? Well, we're, we, we're redeemed. What did God do in the Old Testament with Israel? He redeemed them by taking them out of Israel so that they could go from bondage into what? Freedom, right? They're, they're, re, they're released from bondage into freedom. So there is a sense in which we answer the question, what are we redeemed for? Well, we could easily say we're redeemed for freedom. We have been set free, right? That's the part of what Jesus did for us. But here is where it is interesting. We are redeemed and we're set free for freedom to do what? For freedom to now serve the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, we're never more free than when we are in absolute subservience to the will and purpose of God. People look at us like we're goofy, don't they? That we, that we would submit to a God we cannot see, that we would order and live our lives according to a book that they think has got no practical reality to the 21st century. We submit ourselves to the Lordship of Christ. We live under His authority, and yet we are never more free than we're walking in obedience to Him. And we're never more in bondage when we place ourselves back in darkness and into the bondage of sin. So we live for God freely putting ourselves under the lordship of christ then by what by what are we redeemed well we're redeemed by the blood of the lamb aren't we the blood of the lamb ephesians 1 7 is a very similar verse to colossians 1 14 and there it says that we are redeemed by the blood of christ it's not stated that way in colossians 1 14 but that is 
the means by which we are redeemed. It is the blood of Christ. So there is the fourth word describing what the Father has done for us. Then the last one is we are forgiven. There is forgiveness so that we are redeemed. In him we have redemption for the forgiveness of sins. Again, it's in the present tense, okay? So this forgiveness is continuous. We continue on experiencing this freedom from and this freedom to be forgiven. It's the word aphasis. This word speaks of what it is when God sends something away. Aphasis means simply to send away. So you should probably think of the Old Testament. And again in the Old Testament, there's this beautiful picture on the Day of Atonement. Remember the high priest was to take two goats and he was to cast lots as to what was going to happen to these two goats. One goat was going to be offered as a sin offering and one goat was going to be a phasis sent away, forgiven, if you will. And remember in the picture that God was putting before his people, one goat was the redeemer in that sense. He was the one who was paying the price, covering of sin, foreshadowing ultimately the Lamb of God, and the other was sent away to experience freedom and to be set free. So that is what we have here. God takes our sins and he sends them away. Isaiah 43, 25, I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for your own sake and I will rem not remember your sins. Isaiah 38, 17, for you have cast all my sins behind your back. All of our sins are behind his back. Micah 7, who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgressions for the remnant of his inheritance? You cast all of our sins into the depths of the sea. You see, that's what he says. How long have you been forgiven? What's the extent of your forgiveness? We have been forgiven. We have been forgiven forever, forever, right? The slate is wiped clean. No matter what the accuser comes and says to you, your answer back is, nope, not true. I've been forgiven. My sins are behind my father's back. I am redeemed in the blood of the lamb. I have been qualified. I have been delivered I have been transferred I have been redeemed I have been forgiven that's the voice that we listen to the voice of the word the voice of the spirit of God who says our forgiveness is forever what does that mean that means all of your sins past present and future were all put on that cross and Jesus paid the ultimate penalty in his death and subsequent resurrection for our sin. So that is why we say what God has done for us can't possibly be described in a single word or a single phrase. No, it is all of his grace and it is so incredibly amazing. So what do we take away? You look at this passage and I, I would encourage us to never forget where we came from. Don't forget where we came from, and yet never take your eyes off of where we're going. And I believe if we will do that, then God the Spirit will impress upon us the amazing grace of what God has done, and we will not stop giving thanks for all of God's mercies to us every day. My friends, if you have never put your faith and trust in Christ alone, if you haven't experienced what we've talked about this morning, that you don't believe that you are qualified because you're just not sure you've done enough. And you have not experienced this forgiveness, this transfer that's not happened in your life because you have never put your trust in Christ alone. We would invite you to do that. We would invite you to do that this morning. We would invite you to do that right in the quietness of this time that you would recognize that God's not asking you to try harder. He's not asking you to try at all. He's asking you to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, to put your trust in him and him alone to receive the gift of eternal life. Let's pray. Gracious Father, thank you for this.
amazing description, literally from the life of Paul, and, and that all of us have experienced as well, Father, as we have put our faith and trust in what the Lord Jesus has done for us. We're grateful beyond words for all that you have provided for us. We're thankful, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for this amazing plan of salvation that has delivered us, transferred us, qualified us, rescued us, set us free, redeemed us, Father, and forgiven all of our sins. And for that we say thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.